Today, I want to talk about universal and existential instantiation and generalization. And specifically, I want to talk about this proof that we did in class and how it can be a little confusing when you try to do you generalize it. And specifically, a student came to my uh, office hours and asked about this, and so I wanted to clarify a few things. And so in class, we proved the following statement. Let PXY be a propositional function. Prove that if there exists a Y for all X PXY, then for all X there exists a Y PXY. Now, I'm trying to prove this statement. Sorry, I'm trying to prove this statement. It's important to realize which things are my premises and which things are my conclusion. This is my premise, and this is my conclusion. So I'm going to start with this as my premise. I'm going to perform ru rules of inference, and I'm going to get this as a conclusion. So I'm going to start by writing down my first premise. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my exists y, and I'm going to instantiate that using existential instantiation. So I took my statement, and I took the existential quantifier, and I instantiated it with a variable b, a specific element b. I don't know what b is, but I'm going to say my specific element b is how I'm instantiating it. Next, I'm going to use the for all x, I'm going to instantiate that. So now I can use universal instantiation, take this universal quantifier, and create an arbitrary value a. So I'm essentially saying, for no matter which value I pick, p a b is true. Again, I've got this for some b, arbitrary a. Now I want to use my existential generalization to essentially say, for some b, this is true, and pull that out. So now I took my for some b statement, and I moved that into adding an existential quantifier in front by using existential generalization. And now I'm going to do the same thing with my arbitrary a. So now I see my conclusion, for all x there exists y, p, x, y, because I took the for arbitrary a, and I made that be a universal quantifier in front of my previous statement. So this is all well and good. I followed the steps, and they all work. I'm not having any troubles. What does cause trouble is if I take this same logic and I apply it to the following possibly false statement. So I'm doing a very, very similar thing on this right side. Let p, x, y be a propositional function. And what I want to do is prove that if for all x there exists a y, p, x, y, then there exists a y for all x, p, x, y. Let's identify our premises and conclusions quickly. First, I have the premise for all x, there exists a y, p, x, y. And then I have the conclusion there exists a y for all x, p, x, y. So I'm going to write a very similar proof to this, but there's going to be a problem. So will I try to identify it? All right, let's step through this proof and say it's very similar. I follow essentially the same steps. I start with my premise. For all x, there exists a y, p, x, y. Then I use a universal instantiation to drop my first quantifier, and I say there exists a y, p, a, y for arbitrary a. Then I say existential instantiation to get rid of this existential, say p, a, b for arbitrary a and some b. But then I use universal generalization to add in the for all x, p, x, b for some b, and then I use existential generalization to put this in front. Now, this is very similar to what I just did here, and take a minute to look at it and see that I'm using essentially the same steps. But there's a problem because this theorem is false. So it's false because if I use a propositional statement like pxy is x times y equals 1, where my universe over for x and y is real numbers, then for all x, yes, there does exist a y such that x times y is 1. Of course, I'm thinking non-zero real numbers. So y being 1 over x, for instance, will give me that x times y is 1. But there does not exist a single y such that for all x, x times y equals 1. Right? So we have this problem where Essentially, when I select my for all x, the choice of y is dependent on x, and so I can't reverse these things. So for all x, there exists a y, but that y is particular to x. And what happens is when I was doing this proof, I wasn't very careful, and what happens is that when I did the existential instantiation, since I had already instantiated the variable a, this sum b depends on a. So when I do existential instantiation, if I've already instantiated another variable, b depends on a which means I won't be able to do my existential generalization, um, or sorry, I can't even do my universal generalization of the a to x, because b still depends on that value of a. So this step here, from here to here, from 3 to 4, does not work, because b depends on a, but a has been lost. So this doesn't work. So we have to be very, very careful about when I use generalization, I need to make sure all of my depending variables are not there. It didn't happen here, and it's because when I did universal instantiation, this is true no matter what a value we pick. a does not depend on b because it's an arbitrary a. So universal instantiation does not create a dependence from, to previous things, but existential does. And so in order to show you how this will work in general for a valid proof, I'm going to give you a more complicated proof. Here's a more complicated theorem, slightly more complicated. Let p, x, y, z, w be a propositional function. 
prove that if there exists a y for all x, there exists a w for all z, p, x, y, z, w, then for all x, there exists a y for all z, there exists a w, p, x, y, z, w. Right? So what I've done is I've taken my y and x pairs and I've alternated their quantifiers, and the w and z quantifiers, I've alternated their quantifiers. And again, let's identify our premise and conclusion. Right? Now we have our premise, there exists a y for all x, there exists a w for all z, p, x, y, z, w, and then I have this conclusion. So what we're going to do is we're going to start writing a proof. I'm going to use, essentially, as I go down the line, I'm going to use existential instantiation, universal instantiation, existential instantiation, universal instantiation. And then I'll use existential generalization, universal generalization, existential generalization, universal generalization. And I'll show you how the depending statements work. So again, I can start with my premise. There exists a y for all x. There exists a w for all z, p, x, y, z, w. It's a premise. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use existential instantiation to remove this quantifier and use y, a variable for the value of y. So now I've done my existential instantiation, and when I do an existential instantiation, I need to make sure that for some b, if b is dependent on anything, but I don't have any other variables that I've instantiated. So this b is kind of free, it's not depending on anything. So next I'm going to use my universal instantiation to get rid of this quantifier. Again, I'm using universal instantiation to drop this quantifier and replace it with an arbitrary value, but because it's an arbitrary value, it doesn't depend on b, because it works for every single value. So a is arbitrary. But now I want to use existential instantiation to drop this existential w. And the thing there is that that's going to depend on a and b. So now when I do existential instantiation, I'm taking my there exists w, and I'm turning it into some value d, some specific value d. But it's important that it depends on a and b. It's a very, very important thing. When I do existential instantiation, I care that d depends on these two things, which means I cannot generalize these two things until d has been generalized. But now I want to generalize or instantiate the z. So now when I use universal instantiation, I take my for all z and I turn that into an arbitrary c. Again, this works for all values. It works for every single value. So I don't need to have it depending on d because it works no matter what. I can, once I have these three values, it works for all of them. And therefore, I don't need to have c depending on d. And this is the crucial thing. In the next step, I can use ex existential generalization to remove my d from this list and put an existential quantifier because c does not depend on d. So d is essentially, so now in step six, we see that we've added my existential quantifier because I've taken my for some d statement and I've turned it into my existential quantifier. So I can do that because d, nothing depends on d. None of the variables depend on d. d depends on some things. So I needed to definitely generalize d before I could generalize b or a. But now I have three variables and they don't depend on each other in any way. So I can use my generalization in any order. So I could generalize C, and then B, and then A, and that would complete the proof of this conclusion. Right? Just one more time, I'm not going to write it down, but you need to keep remembering that. If I generalize C, then B, then A, I will finish the proof to get to this conclusion. However, I could generalize in any order I want. I could generalize to say for some B, and then A, and then C, and then everything works out, and I can actually get all sorts of crazy orders. So in addition to this conclusion, I can also prove the following. By start, starting with this proof and then completing by different orders of generalizations, you can also prove these three conclusions. And I recommend you try that out as, a, as an example exercise.